The Germans are well known for their over-engineered heavy and medium tanks, like the Tiger and the Panther, which even though strong weren't enough to repel the onslaught of the T-34 tanks. But today we're going to talk about the Tank Destroyer, one probably well less known but still very popular under the tank gamers. You might know this vehicle, it is the Jagdpanzer 470 v The Jagdpanzer 470 v was basically the chassis of a Panzer IV tank, but with the turret and the top of the hull removed. This was replaced by a highly angled hull. This was so that the production for this vehicle would be somewhat easier, considering there was already a lot of strain on the industry of Germany at that time. But before we dive deeper into this subject, our target for this video is 100 likes within 24 hours. That video will be about the T-44 tank. This was a recommendation given to me by one of my viewers. If we can get the like goal, I will pick a recommendation from the comments about the next subject. So if there is still a tank or armored fighting figure you want me to talk about, leave its name in the comment section down below and I will pick one of those if we achieve the like goal. And the T-44 video will be released two days after the release of this video. Other than that, we are approaching the 2600 subscribers, so if you are not subscribed yet, make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Now without further ado, let's get going. The Jagdpanzer 470 was a tank destroyer fielded by Germany. The story of the Jagdpanzer 470 began back in September 1942, when the Waffenamt issued a request for a new design for their strongest and most formidable armored fighting vehicle. The name of this armored fighting vehicle was of course the Sturmgeschütz. The idea for it was to have a 75mm L70 main armament. This was one of the most powerful main armaments Germany had to offer at that period. It was also one of the most precise main armaments. It was also supposed to have about 100mm of frontal armor, 40-50mm to on the side and the lowest profile possible. The top speed was supposed to be 25 km an hour and it was supposed to be weighing about 26 tons. A new chassis was initially developed for this, but due to the strain on the German industry, they decided to reuse the Panzer IV chassis instead. During this time, they also tried many different prototypes. For example, they tried to fit an 88mm and also the 105mm, but these modifications proved to be somewhat difficult and not feasible. A wooden mock-up was ready by May 1943, and a final prototype was ready at the end of 1943. The leader of Germany at the time accepted the prototype and ordered it to be mass produced as soon as possible, and so it was. However, there was a shortage of the 75mm L70 gun at the time, and this was because other vehicles like the Panther used a similar version, so the Jagdpanzer was fitted with a 75mm L48 instead. But keep in mind this was also the same main armament used as the Stuk 3 at the time and the frontal armor was decreased to a mere 60mm instead of the planned 100mm. But because of the angle of the 60mm it was sufficient. The Jagdpanzer with the 75mm L48 proved to be about as effective as the already produced Sturmgeschütz 3, but it had a more effective and simpler armor design. At the end of its runtime it was produced about 769 to 784 times. It was stopped because the Panzer IV 470 was finally ready. The upgrades included an improvement armor thickness from 60 to 80 mm at the front and a more powerful 75 mm L70 main armament. After testing this it proved to be feasible without any major complications and so it was. The figure was again presented to the leader of Germany on his birthday and he ordered there to be about 700 built for each month, but in the end there were only 185 built each month. To increase production, it was attempted to simplify the construction even more. Near July 1944, the leader of Germany gave the order to switch from the Panzer IV's production to the production of the Jagdpanzer IV, but this was never fully realized. Like always, there's a lot of debate about the figures these tanks have been produced in, but estimations range from 950 times to 930 times. The name can cause some confusion considering it's named the Jagdpanzer 470, but it didn't actually go hunting for other tanks. Just like most tank destroyers, its tactics was to sit at the back or the flanks and to try to give fire support to attacking friendly units. Most of the time they would be placed on the flanks in carefully selected and well camouflaged positions. If the objective was captured, they were to remain there in case of an enemy counterattack. If this wasn't the case, they were to retreat to the rear and await further orders and in retreats, the Jagdpanzers were to make a new defensive line in the new rear lines. As you can imagine, what was the greatest weakness of the Jagdpanzer was that they didn't have a turret. 
So in case of close range engagements, it cannot quickly react to enemy quick movements. So every commander would learn and learn to avoid such situations. Like I previously said, the Jagdpanzer had a very low profile. It was 1 meter and 85 centimeters high. And fun fact, this is exactly my height. It was 3.1 meters wide and 8.5 meters long. This allowed the vehicle to house up to 4 crew members in there. This for that time was a very normal amount. The crew consisted of a driver, a commander, a gunner and a loader and this was also very common. The engine which sat in the Jagdpanzer was a Maybach HL 120 TRM and this engine could produce somewhere around 300 horsepower. In theory a weakness of the Jagdpanzer would be if an enemy soldier with an anti-tank rifle was within 100 meter at its flanks but if you got into situations like these the situation itself would be already very dire. When you are in an elevated position you always want to have at least a decent elevation slash depression for your main armament and to be honest it isn't really that impressive on this armored fighting vehicle. The main armament had plus 20 and minus 5 degree in depression and elevation. This is not a lot but considering the battlefields are mainly flat it doesn't matter too much. But it doesn't hurt to have it in case you need it. Earlier versions were equipped with muzzle brakes. This is what you see at the end of the main armament. But during combat operations the crew often removed them due to the dust clouds it created. As you can imagine if you have a big dust cloud in a well concealed position you are easily giving your position away. So from May 1944 the muzzle brake would be removed from production entirely. You can also see this on the Jagdpanzer 470. As far as I know the Jagdpanzer has three main types. And once you know how to identify these three key features it's unlikely you will mix them up again. One key feature of the normal Jagdpanzer IV was of course the short domain armament and most of the time the muzzle brake. The Jagdpanzer 470A had a longer main armament, the 75mm L70, but also had an incline in the initial part of the superstructure. And the Jagdpanzer 470V had more of a normal Jagdpanzer look, but just the 75mm L70 main armament. Of course during a conflict when you have these numbers of vehicles they are bound to see conflict. The most amount of Jagdpanzer 4 70 Vs were used during a single operation was the last real Grand Western offensive during World War II. This was of course during the Ardennes offensive where 137 vehicles joined this offensive to make it work. During this offensive the Jagdpanzer was used in more roles than only a tank destroyer. It was also used as an assault gun. Now we come to the segment my opinion, keep in mind this is just my opinion, feel free to disagree with me and if you do please let me know in the comment section down below why you disagree with me and what you think of this vehicle. I understand the need for such a vehicle, especially knowing that the Stuk 3 and the Stuk 4 AFVs were successful. The low profile makes sense when you are basically a fire support vehicle which uses camouflage as the main offense. Putting on the 75mm L70 was a good idea. But then switching it over to the 75mm L48 instead does not make a lot of sense because you might as well just keep creating the Stuk 3. The top speed of this vehicle isn't hardly anything to write home about and the elevation and depression are not spectacular either but it will do the job. My personal conclusion is that it was a good armored fighting vehicle but the issue comes that they already had a decent tank destroyer. So there was no need to really use any resources to make another tank destroyer which would perform about the same or just slightly better as the one you already have. One thing that was often overlooked is that in general you also complicate the supply even more which in this case was already quite hectic. So you don't make stuff easier for yourself. Anyways ladies and gentlemen that was the video for today. Thank you all for reaching the like goal. Like I said before we are very close to the 2600 goal. So it would be very cool if we can reach that by the end of the week. So if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. It is free of charge and it would help me out a lot. Just a small reminder that when we reach 100 likes on this video, there will be a video about the T-44 tanks in two days after the release of this video. So make sure to like and share and I'll see you guys in the next video. Have a very, very good day.